The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. I am the host and co-chair of the webinar. My name is Karen Mann, and I have with me my co-chair, Sadita Hassi. We represent the Human Development and Leadership Division of American Society for Quality. This is a global division aiming to enrich the personal and professional lives of our members and non-members across the global community. We continuously look for new speakers with the range of our body of knowledge, which can be found in my ASQ HTML community site. We host monthly webinars, so if you're interested or if you know of anyone um, that would be interested, we would be happy to review their application. Before we begin the webinar, let me go over some webinar rules. If there is any question or comment, please type in under question tab and we will answer the questions throughout and along with the 15 minutes in the very end. Uh, the webinar will be held for 45 minutes and it will be followed by Q&A time for 15 minutes. Those who attend for 40 minutes minimum will receive 0.1 CEU through an email which you can save and use to claim uh, your credit with the ASQ. So we're delighted to introduce to you today our guest speaker um, for the next hour. We look forward to hear from Erin, Erin Urban. Erin Urban is a certified career strategist and leadership coach, helping driven, experienced professionals remove career roadblocks and achieve their potential throughout one-to-one -one coaching and group workshops. She is an international speaker, published author, behavioral scientist, as well as brain behind UPP Solutions and coacheurban.com. Erin is a Forbes Coaches Council member, certified professional development coach, EQI coach, extended disc coach, and on the board of Women's Master Network and a member of International Coaches Federation. Erin, um, we, we have had you in the past and with a webinar and it was absolutely amazing. And I'm sure just like me, many other people are looking forward to hear the great goodies that you have in store for us for the next hour. So the floor is all yours now. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. It is wonderful to have all of you here today. And I'm excited to discuss with you the future of work and your job search during disruption. So as many of you are experiencing right now, we have a significant socioeconomic disruption and it is causing not only personal strife, but professional strife as well. And the challenge here is many of us have been impacted by the socioeconomic disruption but what we may not understand is what does the future of work look like and how can you position yourself to take, take advantage of the opportunities that are available to you? Because so I will share with you that while it does seem that a lot of things are not so great, particularly if you watch the news or you're active on social media, what you hear is usually negative. Well, I'd like to give you a light at the end of the tunnel. First of all, this will pass and with it will come a new normal. But during the time being, I'd like for you to understand that the job search is not dead. So if you're not getting traction, that might be due to some other factors that are outside of the job search itself. Now, I'd like to also share that the job search is not um, roses and sunshine. However, it is not dead. So I want you to keep hope in your hearts and in your minds that you will be able to find the opportunities that you're seeking this might take a little bit longer. So I'd like to learn a little bit about some of you who've joined us today, and we'd like to share a poll about why are you job hunting or why are you interested in learning more about how to find opportunities? So Sarita, if you don't mind yep. I'm sharing that poll with the participants. Yes, so you'll have the opportunity to choose whatever is um, the highest and closest to you. You might fit in a couple yeah. of these, but uh, your priority, basically. Yeah, so why are you job something? Why are you interested in this webinar? What is impacting you right now? Is it because potentially you've been negatively impacted by the current socioeconomic climate? 
or are you just open to new opportunities? Are you concerned that your job might be impacted in the future? So share with us what might be going on with you and what, uh, what your reason is perhaps for joining us with this wonderful webinar. Okay, we'll give it a uh, few more seconds. We have uh, about 60% voting already. You should kind of fall in one of these uh, at some point. Pretty diverse uh, group, I might say. So a little bit of everything, probably. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing, but uh, just choose uh, whatever is closest to you at this time. Okay, so we can close. And we will share the results which we have 45%. I'm just interested in learning more. Uh, I might say I'm happy to hear that. Uh, even though we do have a 22%, I'm fine, but looking for new opportunities. So some movement, 90% sad to see because we have about 200 people here. I was uh, recently laid off or downsized. Uh, we have a 13%, I'm afraid uh, for my job and uh, things aren't looking good. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that. And thank you for sharing, those of you who signed in and participating, thank you for sharing what is, might be driving you, what you'd like to learn a little bit about in this presentation. Regardless of what your answer was, you're in the right place. The first thing we'll be talking about today is what is the future of work? Where do you need to focus? Because as many of you probably already know, some industries are in a downturn and they continually to turn down, for example, oil and gas. While we are seeing increase in oil prices and we're hopeful for the future that we'll have a little bit of an uptrend, the overall trend in general is down. So what is trending right now? What is the future of work? So the future of work we can expect to make come as no surprise to you that there will be more remote work opportunities. Now this is great because this opens the door for people nationwide, globally, to find different types of roles that they really want to search and connect with regardless of location. So this is wonderful news because remote work does open a lot more opportunities for individuals, particularly families that might not want to invest a lot in commutes or may not have the luxury of relocation. So this is great news. On the other hand, remote work, as many of you know, can be a little bit stressful, particularly if you're a people-oriented person. If you're a people-oriented person, being isolated in a remote work environment may not be quite as much Something, something you look forward to, let's put it that way. Might not be so much fun. Um, if this is you, then you might want to stick to your geographic location because there are still companies that will open back up and they will have people coming back into the office. The important thing for you to remember, all of you that are watching, this is temporary. It is not fun. It is extremely stressful. It's highly volatile and uncertain, a lot of ambiguity, but it is temporary we will see some changes come out of this. And one of those is a rise in remote work and most importantly, a rise in technology. Well, some of the things that have been brewing already like remote work environments and have been quote unquote necessary evil in the past will become more the new norm as we move forward. So if you're able to shift into more of a technical type role or something in technology, there are a lot of areas in technology that will be taking off, not only right now, but in the future. There are some industries that are, are, are basically moving out. So they're trending downward and they're moving out. So if you happen to be in one of those industries, know that you can leverage your key skills and expertise to pivot out of that industry into another industry. And here's a sweet spot to help you, for those of you who are interested in a career pivot, you want to find the intersection of your expertise, your interests, and your strengths to make a solid and successful pivot into another area or another industry. So that will help you. So this too will pass and it will be a new normal with more remote work opportunities and other types of industries that are trending upward. Now we'll share with you that I know in Texas specifically, the medical industry has been kind of like the go-to place. Everybody wants to be you know, transition out of oil and gas, maybe into medical or tech. The medical industry is not doing so well right now. And that's mainly because of the pandemic itself. A lot of electric so elective surgeries have been set aside. So while the pandemic is affecting or glutting certain areas in other areas, particularly the money-making areas, it is not helping the medical industry. 
So just keep that in mind if you're thinking about making a pivot. The areas that are trending upward are tech related type industries. So just keep that in mind as, as you're looking. So what else can you keep in mind? Well, the job search itself, the landscape is not vastly different in fact. The only thing that is significantly different in the job search landscape is interviews take longer and it's all virtual, right? There's no in-person interviews, but that was already trending anyway. So that was already starting to happen anyway, pre-pandemic. Now we can expect it to be the new norm because people are finding out it's a lot easier to get interviews with people online. You don't have to coordinate everybody's schedule and they don't have to be co-located. So that you can expect that to be very much the normal as we move forward. Outside of that, some jobs are on hold. But what I recommend is not to put your job search on hold because when those jobs that are on hold unfreeze and they start accepting applications again, they're probably not gonna go back and reinvent the wheel. They'll probably look at the resumes that have already been sifted and vetted for ideal candidates. So keep that in mind, don't want to wait. If they're putting out feelers, you want to be on point and submit your resume. So don't put your job search on hold, even though some positions may be temporarily on hold. So today, what I can share with you is I know for sure this, an effective job search is a mystery, unfortunately, to most professionals. So if you are job searching right now and you're seeing no traction at all, it's likely that your resume and your LinkedIn is not working for you. It might be working against you. And the old tried and true methods just simply don't work. You, you know, having a shotgun approach to job search applications just doesn't work. Using the same resume over and over and over again just doesn't work. And we can't necessarily just rely on our networks anymore. And also, it's important to note that anybody can land a job online if you know the right process. And the good news is today we'll be discussing what that process is. So number one, what a job search miss might actually be holding you back and not helping your job search. So let's clear the air and get those job search myths out of the way so you can get real results. And number two, what is that core curriculum for an effective job search? What does that look like? And what is that strategy that many people may miss? And last but certainly not least, discover how to position yourself to take advantage of opportunities as the job search starts and becoming more active. So what are those myths that might be holding you back? Well, you'd be surprised. Some of these might be something that you truly believe in. And I'm about to shake your belief structure <laughs> because this is based on a lot of research and a lot of in-depth insights into how the job search industry and careers industry actually works. First of all, the myth that 80% of jobs are found through networking is no longer true. Actually, that quote surfaced in 2012 with a uh, survey that was done at that time. That is old news, ladies and gentlemen. 80% of jobs are not found through networking. Actually, it's more of like a 50-50 split. So what I tell my clients is this, if you want to see real results in your job search fast, you want to leverage the online application process and your network. You need to do both, cannot ignore either one. So you want to be able to leverage both for the most success because it's not 80% anymore. And I'll share with you, unfortunately, those people who are not online job search savvy might eventually get a job through that network, but it takes really long because a lot of professionals were busy and they weren't exactly investing in their network when they had a job. Hmm. You need to keep your network warm like well, good coffee, right? So keep your network warm like good coffee. Keep that mantra in mind. It's very, very important because if you do that, there's a lot less time it takes to leverage your network should you need to lean on it. So keep that in mind. Number two, short resumes, and you hear this everywhere, particularly in the US. If you're joining us from overseas and uh, European countries or elsewhere, this may not be the case, and I'll touch on that in a moment. But a short resume does not help you at all. <laughs> in fact, it will hurt you more than anything else. It's very difficult, particularly for experienced professionals, to articulate all of their career contributions and expertise in a short, tiny resume. The reason you hear this is because recruiters in the US have short attention spans. 
they give your resume literally five to six seconds or less. What's the key? We'll go over it in a more in a minute, but the key is the first half of your first page. You have to get their attention right away. In the US, it's very, very important. Now, overseas, this is not necessarily the case. You probably won't hear short resumes are better because you're based off of a CV. CV is very different and a lot more detailed. In fact, you should have three pages or more, in fact. So in the US, you can go up to three pages, you're good, unless you're an executive and then you can go beyond that. But unless you're applying for the C-suite, you might not wanna go past three pages in the US. For those of you overseas, you need to have at least three pages for sure because the European CV is much more extensive. Now I will share with you that some countries like the UK, for example, are trending more towards the US style resume because UK recruiters are finding those easier to get through. Big surprise. But unfortunately, recruiters aren't the only people who make sure that you get the job. You have to get through applicant tracking systems, particularly in the US. And if you have a short resume, that's almost impossible to do. Then you have to wire while the hiring manager. Once you get past the recruiter, what about the hiring manager? Well, if you have a short resume, it's really difficult to express all your contributions. You need to have enough bandwidth to be able to do that without margin squeezing and packing all that information to a little tiny space. It doesn't look good and it doesn't read well. Okay, so listening to experts in your field tell you how to write your resume. The experts in your professional field are great sources of information for things about your field, probably not about resume writing, okay? So be sure to ask them and tap them for what information about how to grow your career and what type of certifications they may be or what, what types of uh, expertise and skills you want to develop. But when it comes to a resume, the experts in your field are good at what they do, maybe not resume writing, unless they are, have certifications in that area as well. Also, using the cover letter, that's a big mistake I see a lot of professionals do. They leverage the cover letter to make all the changes based on each and every single application. So they apply for a job, they leave the resume as it is, and they just change the cover letter. Hmm, doesn't work. Because a cover letter in the US is not sourced through applicant tracking systems or ATS. Your resume is. And in the US, less than 12% of your cover letters are actually read. However, you have to have a cover letter. It is a check the box mentality. They want to see that you took the time to create a cover letter and that you're actually serious about the job. Make sense? So apply for jobs that you're 100% matched for. And this is particularly prevalent in folks who are technical experts or particularly detailed of what you do. You want to apply for a job that's 100% matched for because you think you are guaranteed to get that job. In fact, that's not necessarily the case. From a hiring manager's perspective, when they see that you are 100% matched, you've checked all the boxes, I've got everything, I've got all the expertise, everything that you've asked for, where's room for growth? As a hiring manager, I would look at that and say, hmm, this person will be bored pretty quickly and it takes money to onboard new people. Leave yourself some room for growth. Leave yourself a little stretch room, some room to breathe, some room to grow into the role. You do not need to be a 100% match. Now, if they have a requirement that says, if you don't have this requirement, you will not be considered for the job, they use strong language, then okay, that's probably a requirement you must have. But outside of that, between 65 to 80% match is good because you want to leave some room for growth in the role unless you want to be bored very quickly. The other danger you run is if you're 100% match, you check all the boxes and the hiring manager goes, oh, great, they might be really needed to get a job. Maybe I can get them for cheaper. So keep these things in mind when you are looking and not allow these jobs miss, search miss to get in your way. Oh yes, I'm not done yet. So believing HR professionals or recruiters know exactly how to navigate the job search. They know a lot about what they know. They do not necessarily know about the holistic approach to the job search. In fact, only career coaches like myself really understand that because we've taken the time to do the research and look into it and be educated about it and up, upward on the trends about the whole picture. 
Recruiters want to know what they want to know, and HR professionals know what they know, but they don't necessarily know everything there is to know about finding a job. So take the advice you get from these individuals with a grain of salt, as they say in the US. So thinking that a recruiter, a recruiter will help you find a job, just know that recruiters don't work for employees, they work for employers, and they typically get a commission if they're third party or external recruiters. So they don't work for job seekers, they work for employers. So if you reach out to a recruiter and send them an email, say, hey, here's my resume, keep me in mind, they will take that resume, maybe, if they haven't had 180 emails already that day, and they'll send it into their applicant tracking system because all recruiters in the US have one. And if you show up when they put you in your, they search their data, database, then you show up. If you don't, you don't. That's how it works. Now, if you're in the US, you may have heard of something called a hidden job market. There's no such thing. Not in the sense that you've heard the urban legend of a hidden job market. Now, a hidden job market in the urban legend or the job search myth is that secret society that only these people know about the real jobs is this handshake thing and you need a secret code to get access. No, there's no secret society. There's no hidden cache of jobs anywhere. Hidden job search market is simply jobs that were never ever advertised because they were either created for individuals specifically, they were hired internally and weren't, um, did not have to advertise externally for whatever reason, or they needed someone for that company and through a network, they found someone with ever out ever having to advertise. That is the only thing, uh, that's the only hidden job search market there is. That's the only hidden job search there is. There is no such thing as some secret cache of information that other people can't access. That doesn't exist. So also thinking that a resume writer will create a guaranteed applicant tracking system compatible resume. I have yet to see one and I have a wonderful resume writer I'd like to add. Resume writers, if certified resume writers are trained to write a resume, not necessarily coach you on how to surf the job search world or how to navigate that successfully. Some are, some aren't. Do your research wisely. Also thinking that a resume writer will help you articulate your career contributions. That's not necessarily what they're trained to do. They're trained to write a nice resume. Okay, so again, do your research wisely when you're thinking about connecting with one of these individuals and set your expectations accordingly. How, what is the core curriculum so an effective career growth strategy that most people might miss? So we've got the job search miss out of the way. We cleared the air there. Some of them may surprise you. But now what do we need to do? As my client Jamie shared, he said, it's a daunting process and it can feel that way to those people who aren't knowledgeable about the job search and how it actually works. So I'd like to eliminate that daunting feeling, that feel of fear about the job search might not work for me because we get a lot of these mindset issues, particularly those of us who have, are in transition or laid off. Our sense of self-worth is tied to our jobs. And when we're in transition or in between jobs, we may feel less than. I'd like to share with you that you are still a valuable person. You have a lot to add to someone who is lucky enough to have you. And I want you to remember that. And through this process, I would like to help you remind yourself of that and be able to source that value and articulate it in your dossier, which is your resume and your LinkedIn. Okay, you ready? What can you do to make your dossier stand out? So when I say dossier, I mean your resume and your LinkedIn. In the US, your resume and your LinkedIn are of equal, if not greater importance with your LinkedIn. Over overseas, maybe not so much. So the CV is still king, still, um, and the LinkedIn's still a little new overseas, but it's still important and starting to be used. So it's good to be, have some information about that. So let's have our second poll. What is the number one most important key to getting success in your job search? I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. What do you think? Is the most important key. So, Savita, if you don't mind, I'm yes. That poll. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you because there is so much uh, good information, and uh, I would like us to kind of sit for a second. If you guys have questions, uh, please continue to use the question box. I'm seeing some coming, 
uh, because sometimes the questions come uh, as, as they're listening instead of at the end. So as you take a note or just list them on the question uh, box, we will uh, take them at the end. Um, so that yes. being said, uh, let's see. Let's see what, uh, what the audience think. We have a couple of options. We have a great resume and LinkedIn, knowing what types mm -hmm. of roles to aim for, having a great recruiter to help you out. We have one here, being able to interview really well. Of course. Uh, Which one is <laughs> yeah, the exactly. most important? This is going to be a tough one. <laughs> 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 They're all important. <laughs> As before, we go by priority for you at this time. Yeah, and I'd like to add while you're thinking about that, that what I mentioned uh, previously about your mindset and your job search is extremely important. Um, I'll be talking about more, more about mindset and job search in the months to come. And I've actually given a mindset boot camp on my online group um, in the previous months as well. Because your mindset, if, if there's one number one fundamental element that sees you to have, it finds whether or not you see career growth or not, is truly around your mindset. Because quite frankly, if you believe you can't, you're probably right. Mm -hmm. And it's not because you. It's just because that's what you believe. It drives your outcomes. And as you may or may not know, I'm, I'm a behavioral scientist and, and I do a lot of research in neuroscience. And this has been proven that if you believe you can't succeed, you won't. So it's very important for you to remember, all of you listening, all of you tuning in, that you matter, you have impact, and you do have value. And I wanna help you express that, okay? So Thanks, Gary. Have, yeah, we, we can close it because we do have some uh, good response uh, percentage here. So we do have, let's share those with uh, the audience as well. We have 44% who believe knowing what type of uh, role to aim for. So this uh, self-reflection and awareness. And then we have 29% uh, being able to interview really well. 26% um, mm -hmm. a great resume and LinkedIn. And we have 1% which I'm surprised, uh, having a great recruiter to help you out. Um, these are... They've been listening. <laughs> yeah, been I listening. guess the word yeah, recruiter give itself. Give yourself a round of applause. Give yourself a round of applause. Pat yourself on the back right now. Good job. I'm so proud of you guys. So you're right. Yes. Have your recruiter help you out. You know what? If you can make a connection with a great recruiter, do so. But oftentimes it's a, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. So they reach out to you for a job. It may not be ideal for you. You're like, you know what? I may know somebody, so you refer them and you're making their job easier. You may develop a rapport. That's when you start to build a relationship with that recruiter. I've done that in the past and it's been very useful. But not all recruiters are made the same, unfortunately. And some are kind of rude. So again, recruiters work for the employers, not the employees. So you guys are smart, you're right, you answered that correctly. And also you are correct for the majority of you that said having a target to aim for. You're absolutely right. Woohoo! Round of applause. I'm so proud. So this is great. Having a target to aim for. So that is the number one most important thing for you to see traction, whether you are actively job seeking or not, whether you're just looking to grow your career. You need to know where you're going. If you don't have a target to aim for, it's really hard to, to hit it, <laughs> right? So we have to have a career target. But what does that look like? Hmm. Well, when you're thinking about your career target, what types of roles are you searching for? Now, here's a tip. If you're searching for very disparate roles, so they're very dissimilar, they use different skill sets and even maybe different work styles to like sales and project management, very, diff very different. That might be a little hard for you. So you'll need to choose which one fits you best. But if they're related, and probably most of you are searching for related roles that use similar expertise, similar abilities and similar skills, that is what we want to do. You can think of it as like a job search family tree. And all the roles you're looking for are on the same branch, right? They're cousins. So you're looking for related types roles. Now, what you can do to help yourself out is go out there and pull down two, three, maybe four 
ideal job descriptions. These job descriptions are in that job search family tree. And when you read them, you go, oh, yeah, I really like this. Now, it doesn't really matter where the job is for multiple reasons, either remote work reasons or because really at this stage, we're trying to understand what this might look like for us. Because this will help drive your creation of your entire dossier, your LinkedIn and your resume. So when you have those job descriptions, you want to analyze them. What kinds of expertise are they asking for? What kind of keywords do they have? Skills, expertise, lingo. This is all really, really important. Very important, extremely. Lots of importance here, lots of importance. I will, I will reiterate myself. I'll probably repeat myself self several times. Having a target, being relevant to that target throughout your job search is huge because we have to be able to sync. We have to be relevant for multiple reasons. And I won't bore you with a lot of the gobbledygook or the nerdy stuff behind it, but for one thing, for applicant tracking systems. Applicant tracking systems, or ATS, are quite simply a word match program. Now, there are other things that they do, like they look for years of expertise and other, they also source like your LinkedIn profile and they'll do other things as well. But by and large, they are a word match program. If you don't have the right words, guess what? You're not a match. That's it. That's it. That's that's all you got. So that's number one. Number two, at the recruiter level, they have finely tuned themselves to be able to see a pattern in someone's career or resume. Okay. If they don't see that pattern in the first five to six seconds, you're done. They're not going to give you a call. So you have to be able to be highly relevant for the types of roles you're seeking. And that also saves you a lot of pain and agony when it comes to optimizing your resume for every single application. Oh, did I forget to mention that? Yes, you have to optimize your resume for every single application. Yay, don't worry. If you do target your resume and your full dossier ahead of time, this is a lot easier, <laughs> okay? So it'll take a lot of the weight off of you and take a lot of time because no one has time to rewrite their resume. If you target it in advance, you don't have to. Make sense? So this is extremely important. Also, for LinkedIn, you want to be reached out to by recruiters for the right jobs, not for jobs that you're not interested in. In order to do that, you have to be relevant to those jobs. See where I'm going with this? So having a target to aim for is the most important first critical step you will do in developing your dossier, your resume, and your LinkedIn profile. Now, next is a prep for a digital job search. And we'll go into more detail here in a second. We want to prep for that digital job search because historically we thought we could get around the system. And in the US, we call the online job application process going into the black hole, like pitching your resume into the black hole, because most people don't know how to navigate that job search online. But folks, I hate to tell you, the future of work will be online. There'll be less and less and less human contact as we move forward. And in fact, 10 years or so, you can expect most of this to be automated. Most of us have a personal AI, like a Google something or an Alexa or Siri. We all have those little personal assistants, or maybe there's one listening right now to your conversation. <laughs> Well, those will probably find our jobs in the future or something like it. You'll be asking your Google, Alexa, or Siri, hey Siri, find me a job. Okay, what type of role would you like? And you go through the process and they find you a job. I'm not making this up. This is real people and it will happen. AI is already replacing recruiters. So don't expect the job search to become more human. It will become less human and more technical. And the sooner you know how to navigate that space, the better off you'll be. So let's look at that. First of all, more interviews will be online ever than before, obviously, for obvious reasons right now, but moving forward, they will continue to be online. And pre-pandemic, they were already a lot of interviews being had online. The, the first inter interview is like a phone screening interview, it's always a phone screening interview, never an in-person interview. But there was a time where that itself was in person. There was a time in ancient times when dinosaurs roamed the earth 
where people went to a company and fill out an application in person. Let's see where we are now. So this is going to become more and more and more digital and more and more automated as we move forward. Interviews will also be less human. And it's already started, in fact. AI recorded interviews are not a thing of the future. They are here now. And I've already had clients that have interfaced with these. What they are is they ask you a question. You have so many minutes to answer the question. And you have maybe, hopefully, a couple different tries to re-record your answer. And you're talking to a screen. Yay! That's not stressful at all. <laughs> anyway, the good news is many roles that are on hold will reopen. So just know that if you're out there right now and you feel like, how can I stand out from all this noise? We'll help you do that. And know that things will start to pick up. Again, this is passing. We're moving through it. It is a phase. It is traumatic. It is a big deal. Let's acknowledge that. But also know that there is hope and we will find a job. But how I have less and less and less human interaction as we move forward, because automation is here to stay. I mean, look at remote work. It used to be a necessary evil, something a lot of companies viewed suspiciously. Now they're finding, whoo, hey, we can save on real estate. Let's get all these people remote. Oh, I won't get off on the rabbit trail of why that's not as always a great idea, but it does open up some opportunities. So that is also good. But it's important to understand that nothing has really changed dramatically in the hiring landscape outside of the interview portion. By and large, digital job search was already here. We just need to know how to leverage it. And the first way to do that is to have an online compatible resume. I mentioned the target before, and that helps you develop an online compatible resume. Because in the US particularly, most every resume and application goes through an applicant tracking system or ATS. Now, how do you know you're in an applicant tracking system? That's easy. You have to create a username and a password. If you have to create either one of those, you're in an applicant tracking system. Congratulations. And you probably have to answer a bunch of nosy questions, upload your resume. That is an applicant tracking system. As I mentioned before, typically, by and large, it is a word match program. They're getting more sophisticated, and I won't bore you with the different types of applicant tracking systems, but what I will tell you is that having a fancy resume with a bunch of graphics and fonts and heavy formatting and anything in a table or a text box doesn't work. Don't do it <laughs> because you don't know what type of ATS or applicant tracking system you're interfacing with, and if you don't know, then you won't know whether it will find or see your words in a table, which you would think would be a really easy way to organize information in the document. But in fact, when it's parsed into a system that turns it into plain text, all that information disappears. You don't want that. So your resume should be plain, plain word document, not a PDF, okay? And, I mean, they're not gonna change your information, it's okay. <laughs> Blame word document, no heavy formatting, no text boxes. You can use bold font and you can use round bullet points, but you must be online compatible. So it has to have a target, must be tailored to each application. Do not use the shotgun application process. That does not do anyone any good and it wastes a whole lot of time. And most importantly, your LinkedIn profile is more important than ever before. So historically, LinkedIn has been mostly used most of the time for people who are in transition and seeking a new job. Moving forward, because we'll have more remote work and the future of work, your LinkedIn will be how you stand out as a professional. Because when you're distanced from your team, it's a little bit more difficult, as many of you may have already found out through Zoom meetings, that it's harder to articulate your brand. It's hard to stand out. You don't have those one-off conversations as easily. And if you're a remote worker, then how else are people supposed to know what you're great at and what you can do? A lot of the methods that LinkedIn influencers have used in the past to elevate themselves on LinkedIn will start to become the norm for a lot of people in order to elevate yourself as a professional. So keep that in mind. And virtual networking is here. Now it's rough, it's raw. Karen, can you hear me? I'm sorry. 
Yes, I can hear yes. you. Yes, uh, yeah, I just wanna uh, remind you, we have about five more minutes for the presentation itself. We have a couple of questions and we have one poll, so uh, we can address it as, uh, as you wish, uh, as you feel it's a better, as a benefit. We can either start taking questions in five minutes and then kind of tie it up to your material or skip the poll, uh, just so you know where we're at. Thank you. Okay, sounds good. I will, I will move it along. So virtual networking is here. It is rough, it is raw, and it is not so polished, but it will become more normal. And people will start to work on making this more engaging and more uh, approachable for people. And what does that look like? Well, a lot of people might be using Zoom. You've not probably already noticed that a lot of conferences are, are gone virtual or have been closed or canceled while people figure out how to make this virtual platform more engaging. And again, it's rough and raw right now, but will become more agile and adaptable as we move forward. Most importantly, polish your LinkedIn profile, because as I mentioned before, LinkedIn will be the stage for you to be able to express yourself and you know, your personal brand moving forward, whether you're looking for a job or not, whether you're just looking maybe elevate your career. You have to show up 100% when you are in virtual meetings, however. So moving forward into the future of work, it's very important to show up 100%. So if you noticed, I'm using body language, I'm smiling, I'm making eye contact, I'm not sitting here monotone with no expression on my face. So that's an example of showing up. You actually have to emote 30% more than you would normally when you're faced with a camera. And that's due to a whole host of neurological reasons that I won't bore you with right now. But get comfortable with that camera because it is the new normal. So let's discover how to position ourselves and take advantage of opportunities really quickly. And at the end of this particular session, I will share with you a guide for free that I would love for you to download and utilize to help you express and articulate your, your value and your career contributions as a professional. But number one, your resume must be relevant to the jobs that you're seeking for. And it must clearly express that in the first half of the first page. Now, this is because of recruiters and hiring managers and the fact that people's attention spans are very short. So you want to have all of your key expertise right front and center, as well as your select accomplishments on the first half of the first page. Please ditch long, overly long-winded summaries because they don't do you any good. No one reads them. And clearly articulate your accomplishments. And the free guide I have at the end of the session will help you do that. But the vast majority of resumes are missing this element. It's hard to talk about yourself. It's hard to express your career contributions. And I know that. And because I know that, I have developed a guide that helps you express exactly how you leverage your key skills and expertise towards a net positive outcome in either your current role or your previous role. So the nice thing is, even if you're not interested in seeking a new job, this will help you at performance review time. It also helps you in the interview because you'll inevitably get a question that you have to answer along these lines. So let's go ahead and skip the poll in the interest of time. And I'll talk about creating the impact inventory and go ahead and get you to that link quickly. So first of all, you want to start with your most recent positions, work your way back through your career history. And you want to consider what you've done to positively impact your company, your clients, or your team. Did you improve something? Did you create better functionality? Did you, what did you do to make an impact on the organization? And for some of you, just doing a really good job, that also matters. Did you avoid a risk? Did you mitigate a risk? Did you find, you know, better productivity? Did you improve a state, a current state of anything at all? So that's a, some things to consider. And like I said, contributions are just a part of the job, do matter. Your entire resume, your dossier, your LinkedIn profile, all must articulate your career contributions. This is very, very important because it's the biggest gap I see in almost every professional's dossier is they just don't talk about how they may have add value. It's just roles and responsibilities. And that doesn't help you stand out from all the noise online. So you need to get over bragging. So the fear of bragging, it's not about bragging, it's about stating facts. Stating facts around how what you did matters. Because we need to articulate our value to stand out or stand on the sidelines. And in order to help you stand out, I have uh, this impact inventory guide. Please do write this down and let's go ahead and start taking those questions. 
questions. And I'll flip to the next slide where you can uh, reach out to me and connect with me on LinkedIn. Thanks. Um... Uh, thanks a lot, Erin. We've spoke a lot about this topic even before having this webinar. And uh, as you see yourself, um, it's pretty much needed a lot. <laughs> so I really appreciate your very practical guidance and trying to uh, to sum it up in, in 45 minutes, which is not uh, it's not possible. So I do invite everyone to reach out to Erin. She does have, uh, you mentioned you have some weekly uh, virtual meetings as well if you want to share about that as well because yeah. i see many questions and uh, where can they find yes. you i do have a linkedin live i'm live on linkedin every tuesday at 11 a.m uh, central standard time perfect so uh, connect with me on linkedin uh, i will share my i want to give you time to write this down first but i'll share with you uh, my linkedin and some other ways to con connect with me Great, because if I miss somebody's question, I don't want to be blamed. You know where to find her. So let's uh, let's try to do this uh, very uh, quick sort of a question and answers to try to capture a little bit uh, most of the questions we have. So first one is: Do you think that uh, this period will affect uh, minorities mostly? Not just minorities. Um, while, that it, while that is a concern right now, and I understand where you're coming from with that question, it's not just minorities. It has a lot to do with uh, professional positions and what your experience is and what industry you're going into. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's the biggest uh, causal factor. And what unfortunately we, we will be looking at moving forward is employers may take a little advantage of the situation right now to um, underpay. I hate to say that, but I'm just being honest. I want mm -hmm. you to be armed with the right information. So even experienced prof professionals can expect not quite to get the salary that they would like because it is an employer's market right now. But um, really it's more industry and experience driven than, than other things. I won't say or, or, or negate the fact that bias does play into it because everybody has bias and a lot of, a lot of it's unconscious. So that is unfortunate, but it's, it is a reality uh, right yeah. now. It's not just gonna happen now. Um, so staying at the tech portion, you mentioned before uh, growth in there. Um, are you talking about data scientists or that is, do you see that as a field of quality professional could uh, move? I know you are very experienced in tech professionals as well. And uh, we'll mm -hmm. try to keep it short, <laughs> but what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there are um, almost a maximum amount of attendees right now. We have a maximum of 200, just over 250 yep. some. We have 222 people. So thank you so much for participating. But data science um, automations, robotics process automation and business transformation are two uh, burgeoning fields. They are taking off quite a bit. Data science was already taking off pre-pandemic, but now it really will take off. Uh, robotic process automation and business transformation. Business transformation is a fancy term for saying we're going to lay people off and automate everything. Mm -hmm. um, but those types of fields will be taking off quite a bit. Uh, expect more of a gig economy. So the gig economy was predicted that it was going to be this big thing and then it kind of tapered off. It's back, people. It is definitely back. So more contract work is to be expected. Mm -hmm. So try to become comfortable. And um, you mentioned uh, LinkedIn. I have. Uh, I will try to sum up some questions about LinkedIn itself. Uh, what would you recommend about that in terms of um, somebody said I would like to post a video about self promotion uh, or how much detail should I have on LinkedIn? Should the LinkedIn be updated as the resume with all details and uh, dates mm -hmm. uh, showing the most current job and all of that? Uh, from LinkedIn okay. standpoint, what's your best tip here? LinkedIn can be a whole webinar on itself. Exactly. In fact, um, connect with me, if you connect with me today um, or, or anytime, it doesn't really matter. But I did earlier today, my LinkedIn Live was about LinkedIn and leveraging okay. your LinkedIn profile. So it was quite extensive. It's about 50 minutes of material. Great. And you can find that in my post on my profile. So if you connect with me or have already connected with me, um, you can find that information. A little bit more detail probably helps answer that question. I didn't go over the most important parts of your LinkedIn profile. Now, how to advertise yourself on LinkedIn. One of the things I didn't get to was you need to be active on LinkedIn. LinkedIn give preference to people who use a platform. No big surprise there. Um, so if you utilize a platform, they will give you preference, share articles, um, comment, and not just like, liking isn't enough anymore. You really need to engage, mm -hmm. engage with people and 
don't be afraid to be a little self-promotional. Add some videos. If you are job seeking, add a video about your top accomplishments. If you're comfortable with that. Now, not, that's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, if you like writing, you can publish on LinkedIn. And in fact, back in the day, <laughs> that is how I became a LinkedIn influencer, is I started writing and publishing because I was frustrated because I wasn't utilizing all my expertise and skills in my current role. And I started writing and publishing and connecting on LinkedIn. And I actually was reached out through LinkedIn for two jobs. I never had to apply. So ideally, that's what you want. And uh, you can also, as it says, Erin said, to follow on her today's uh, speech about that. So going to more uh, contractors sort of jobs and uh, they may have many, many positions. And uh, sometimes the ATS might not want to take so many jobs and like how do you see that being updated on a resume having multiple multiple uh, dates and depending on the project they had mm -hmm. if you have a very dense resume and you are project oriented i recommend utilizing what i call a project addendum that is a supplemental document external to your resume it's not mm -hmm. attached to your resume you You can, depending on the field, you can attach it to your resume and have it be sourced through applicant tracking systems. The challenge is um, at the recruiter level, if they see it's more than three pages, which it will be, that, that might throw a red flag for them. So if you're in, let's just say, a, a more technical field, project management, um, engineering, et cetera, you might be able to get away with it. And certainly if you're not in the US, if you're overseas, length has, has less of a stigma, if you will. But a project addendum is literally a list of your high level, high profile projects that articulate the business case for the project, a very, very brief overview of your involvement. Like if you overcame some sort of challenge, what, how you were led with your skills, and most importantly, the impact of the project on the company, the client, et cetera. So um, that is really what a project addendum is, and it helps you also source your career contributions. So hopefully that's helpful. And I know I, that didn't exactly answer the question, but I guess yeah, yeah. Can. Actually, uh, I think a separate uh, one could be a good source. Maybe using key keywords. I do have a page myself, which is uh, I have only keywords on my resume. But then, if they want, they can go to the link. But then the keywords are kind of guide them to the resume at least. Um, another question we had about generalist sort of jobs. Uh, do you see a need at this kind of um, particular job market to specialize or what thought do you have on the jobs that are a bit generalist? In you? If you, um, let's just say you're a jack of all trades and a master of none, I would mm -hmm. try to find a pick a focus, leverage the, the targeting process I mentioned and help you have a target to aim for because hiring managers want to see that you know what you want to do because if they don't see that then they're they're less likely to hire you now if you're truly a generalist um and and talking about the future of work any job that is repeatable will be replaced full stop that is happening now so long term, if you're not at the fruition of your career and trying to wrap up the last five or 10 years or so, if you still have some career longevity, you might definitely want to keep this in mind. So it's a repeatable job like accountants, sorry accountants, but the repeatable type jobs will be replaced. And that's happening now. That's a part of the business transformation. That's a part of robotics process automation. It's happening now. So mm -hmm. just keep that in mind when you're looking for roles. Um, you can still be a generalist as long as it has that unrepeatable human touch to it. So just, I encourage you to, to keep that in mind when you're, when you're looking. And another uh, question, which is uh, covering that 20 something percent that uh, did lose their jobs um, is about the gap that, that your resume or the LinkedIn page might create. Um, is there any specific need to to show the specific date on the last job they lost due to downsizing or uh, not necessarily lying, but I, how would we address that? Oh, good question. So you in the US, you have a three month window before mm -hmm. a background check will show that you have left your job, uh, no longer collecting um, 
uh, salary from the, they're not reporting you to the IRS basically. So you have a three month window. And then after that, you need to fill that gap with something. So what I recommend, and I recommend to do this anyway, um, I, I do recommend you be active in a professional organization, volunteer your time. If you volunteer your time and that takes up enough of your time, let's say 20% or more, you can actually have that as your current role. Now, some people, and I have actually said this myself in the past, if you can consult, even if it's pro bono, that also is legitimate and can fill that gap. Here's the thing. If you decide to be a consultant, you need to have a business page on LinkedIn. And that means having a, a business identification number through a government or official agency. And it's a little bit of a process. The reason I say that is because too many people just throw up, you know, Jack Smith consultancy and they're just putting it there to bridge a gap and recruiters know that. So if you are going to be a consultant, whether real or imagined, it needs to be legitimate. Hopefully that makes sense. And I'm not saying that having a gap is the end of the world. We are in a highly competitive job market, so I will not um, try to sweeten that any. I, I want to be real with you so you mm -hmm. have real information and make the right decisions. It is easier to find a job if you have a job. It's unfortunate. Absolutely. It is an un unconscious cognitive bias from their recruiters. They, they don't think about it, but it's it happens. It's just research has proven that. So if you can mitigate that gap through the, through volunteering or a consultant, legitimate consulting, then do that. Um, and you want to remain active in your profession anyway. So volunteer with ASQ. <laughs> We always <laughs> welcome volunteers, but uh, I do agree with you that being active, uh, not when you you are so pushed into, I have to find it now, uh, might be yeah. what needs to happen all the time. Um, another question is about uh, any tips on phone uh, interviews? It's kind of a very broad question, uh, but anything particular we might want to be aware of at this time? Hmm. Interviews, that could be another, that could be another webinar. In fact, I'll be doing um, my next LinkedIn Live next week will be about interviews, in fact, um, about virtual interviews, specifically how to show up online, et cetera. So I'll be talking in depth about that on LinkedIn okay. Live next day Good. at 11 p.m. CST. And um, you post so, these links on your page, because I had somebody ask as well, uh, on your uh, LinkedIn page, Erin? Uh, yeah, so how LinkedIn Live works is you want to connect with me. So you'll notice um, down there, there's my um, LinkedIn profile address. You can connect with me. And what will happen is um, right now, because LinkedIn Live is still in beta testing, I, mm -hmm. I can't give out a link for you to connect to like a, like a webinar. It doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Uh, what you can do is just set a reminder for yourself mm -hmm. and at around 11 o'clock, be on your notifications page. You'll get a notification that I'm live and you can just click that notification and participate. It's great to participate. I'll say hi, you know, you'll join in, you can ask questions live. It's very, very interactive, so. Okay, and uh, we will, again, we shared a lot of information and uh, as Erin uh, said, you can reach out to her. We cannot take all the questions, they keep coming. And we have two more minutes and I have to cover the next webinar coming, but we'll take uh, one last question is um, about uh, job changing uh, when you have also industry changing. And I know you have personal experience about that. Um, a functional resume would help in that case. Uh, I don't know much about functional resume, just read it a little bit online, but uh, what would you right. recommend as a last comment here? That that's a very complex question. <laughs> exactly, that's why. So, I'm are you thinking about a career pivot? You want to find the intersection of your strengths, interests, and expertise. Ideally, you want to leverage as much expertise as you can, mm -hmm. because that will give you a solid springboard into your next role. So let's just say you're shifting out of I don't know, like oil and gas. We have a lot of people in Houston, Texas, for example, or in Texas in general, or in the world, <laughs> they're shifting out of oil and gas into other industries. So you want to be able to leverage your transferable, as they call them, transferable skills. And, and then also see if the roles that you're searching for, how are they related to your previous roles? And start to draw that correlation for the reader. Um, we need to make it obvious. And if 
by the way, now here's 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 a tip that's worth gold. You own your job titles. That's right. As long as a job title reflects what you actually did, you mm -hmm. own it. So if you need to add a prefix or a suffix to make it align more with the trajectory you're headed in, do so. Because that's the number one search, particularly on LinkedIn recruiter, is by job title. And recruiters don't know everything there is to know about the job. They just know the job description, they have job titles around the bout. And unfortunately, they are also determining whether we go to the next stage. So we want to make it obvious for them. So hopefully that helps you. Also a quick tidbit, if you want to learn more about um, job search and growing your career, and you are on Facebook and you're comfortable with that, I do have an online group and you can request access. If you do request access, I do ask that you answer the questions because it is a private group and I do guard that closely to make sure there are no um, scammers or spammers inside the group but i'm active in that group and the live uh, linkedin lives also broadcast live inside my group as well so plenty You're of welcome. resources you guys and <laughs> thanks Aaron, for sharing all this uh of course as we said it's not gonna be uh, a one webinar to to solve all these um challenges we're uh, going through so please uh follow these um hints and then try to see what's best for you so thank you again uh erin thank you kieran uh, as well and uh, we want to, to say that our next webinar is already uh, posted on May SQ. That's on July 8th. We will be talking. We're trying to keep everything around what's going on right now. We're talking about well-being next, uh, next month. So well-being in the workplace and how to manage burnout and best practices and restoring balance with uh, Ilona Salmons. Um, that uh, information is already on my SQ event. So feel free to register. We do have one survey which is uh, one minute or less. Uh, as usual, we are going agile. We change as uh, you provide us feedback. And uh, are you? Uh, yes, you'll get an email from me in uh, an hour or so. Uh, for those who attended 40 minutes minimum, so you'll get a separate email, not, not the follow-up email. Thank you again for your time, and we look forward to having you on our next webinar, and hopefully we'll feel all better as we get through this together. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone.